ونور الأبصار وضياءها أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الهاديين المهديين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد قال الله العلي العظيم في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياتي أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد أهلا بكم أهلا بكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This evening, our topic is about marriage. However, I would like to divide the topic of marriage into three categories. The first part will be about the importance of marriage in Islam. Number two, how to choose a spouse according to the Islamic point of view. Number three, who has the right to choose the spouse? Is it the child or the parent? Because one of the problems we have is when a child reaches at the age of choosing a spouse, one of the crushes between the family sometimes is about who has the right to choose. A child thinks that I am the one who has the right to choose, and the parents think they have the right to choose for the child, not the child. Now, who has the right in Islam to make that choice? Is it the parent or is it the child? Which one? So that will be the three categories that we will be talking about this evening, inshallah. The first part about the marriage is this ayah that we just read. And the ayah is in Surah to rum ayah 21. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا he said, one of the miracles of Allah is that Allah created a woman from a man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is miracle that he created a woman from a man. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the reason why he created a woman. And then he says, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا The reason and the purpose is, Allah stated, and here the reason why I mentioned this, because if we understand the Quran, it will help us to make a right decision when it comes to choosing a spouse. Why? Because here you have some of the people, they think that the reason why they have to have a wife is because they are lonely. And they have it when they have a wife, at least they have somebody to talk to. They have somebody to spend time with. They have somebody to tell their problems. So the reason why they get married is because they need someone. That is one. Some people know. They said, I want a wife because I want somebody who can wash my clothes. <laughs> right? My clothes get dirty. I need somebody who can do the laundry back and forth. By the time I come to from work, my car, my, my clothes are hung up, are ironed. I don't have to worry about it. But he forget that there is a laundromat next door. <laughs> Who do that too, right? You can take to the laundromat, they can do that for you. You don't have to worry about a wife being at home. So that is one of the reasons. So some people, one of the reasons is to get somebody at home in the name of a wife and their job is to wash their clothes. That is some people. Some people know their understanding of marriage is 
No, I want to marry someone so I can have the choice, uh, my choice of food. Bill Kokatun. You want biryani? You get it. Right? You want, I don't know, Nahari? You get it done at home. Any kind of food you want, a wife is there and her job is to do this. So the aim of marriage for those people is to satisfy their desire of the food. That is some other people. Now, some people, everybody has their own reason, but when you come to the Quran, Allah says all these reasons have no base in the sight of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the reason why we created a woman so a man and woman can live together as husband and wife, Allah says, ilayha, so that you complete each other. Meaning, a husband is one half, a woman is another half. Allah created them when they come together in marriage. Each one of them complete another so they become complete and perfect going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. That is the aim. That's what Allah said. Let us go no ilayah. So that you will find a sukun. A sukun means tranquility, peace of mind. That is one of the reasons. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً And here's another lesson, brothers and sisters. Allah said, that we place a love between the two of you. Here, one of the mistakes we do, when we want to get married, we want to fall in love, then get married. That's our intention. That I want to get to know the person, I have to spend the time, I have to know the person, one year, two years. By the way, you know something? You can never ever get to know a human being till the day of judgment. You can know some part of a human being, but you cannot know human being in full other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that matter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when we get married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, after the marriage, Allah placed and mawadda and the blessing and the love comes in after that. And that's what you see when our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Khadija alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa When the Prophet met Khadija, did they have some time they spent together years before they got married? No. They didn't have any time to get to know each other before they got married. You go to the Quran, the same thing Yusuf, the same thing other Prophet who got married in the Quran, Sulaiman. Before he married Balqis, how many years did they get to know each other? There was no years. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his mercy upon the husband and wife is that after they find each other and they get married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the both heart and placed the love for each one of them. And that's what the Quran says, وَجَعَلَ <laughs> بَيْنَكُمْ Then Allah placed a love between the two of you. That is number one of the blessings of the marriage. Number two, wa rahma, and the mercy also comes after that. So the love follows after after the marriage, and then after the love comes, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala automatically create a mercy, a care for both of you in the heart. The husband is caring for the wife, and the wife will be caring for the husband as well. And then at the end of the ayah, Allah said, Inna fi dhalika la ayat. Allah said, All this what I just mentioned, Allah said, is a lesson. Not for everybody, for people who think, people who use their mind at least to think about life, to think about all these miracles. Now, this ayah is one of the ayahs in the Quran talks about the importance of marriage. Now, let me take you to the hadith of the Prophet about many ahadiths we have from the Prophet indicating and talking about the importance of marriage. One of the hadiths, the Prophet says, the night of Isra and Mi'raj, when the Prophet was taken to the heaven, Jabra'il showed him the heaven and he showed him the hellfire. Now here the Prophet said, when I look in the fire, I saw the most and the majority of the people of hellfire are the single ones of my ummah. Unmarried people, they are the majority of the hellfire. Here, by the way, let me let me let me let me rephrase here. 
it doesn't mean that if I choose not to get married, I'm going to end up in the hellfire. No. What the prophet meant is, if a person fails to get married, and then he, fail, he or she fails to control themselves, and that led them to haram, then they end up in the hellfire. But otherwise, if a person doesn't want to get married, but he or she can protect themselves, they don't fall into haram, that's fine Islam. There are other companions, and the prophet in the Quran, they didn't get married. One of them is Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, up to date, he's still single, and that doesn't make him to go to hellfire. Khidr alayhi salam, when he go to the history, Khidr alayhi salam, when he was growing up, his father, who was the leader of the society of that day, did he force Khidr to get married? Khidr said, I don't want to get married. I want to be single, because I want to dedicate my time more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The father got him married twice. One was a young lady, the other one was an older lady. And none of these two Khidr even look at them. And finally, the father put him in the room and locked him up <laughs> as a punishment for not listening to him. Three days later, the father opened the door and Khidr was gone. <laughs> and the key was under the father's pillow. Huh? He was sleeping under the, uh, under the key. The key was under his pillow. How did Khidr find out? How did that happen? That is a different story. But the point is, these are awliya Allah, but they didn't get married. So in Islam, if a person didn't choose to get married, it's fine. Because marriage in Islam, the rule is mustahab. The first rule in Islam about marriage is mustahab. However, the rule changes sometimes to become wajib for others and not mustahab anymore. And that is when a person cannot control themselves and there is a fear he or she might fall into haram, then the rule is wajib upon that person. That is hadith number one about the importance of marriage. Hadith number two about the importance of marriage. The Prophet said, Rak'atan yusallihim al mutazawwij. Two rak'ah, a married person prays in front of Allah. This is 70 rak'ah of a single person, single man or a woman, not married. He or she stand in front of Allah to perform 70 rak'ah namaz. The Prophet said Allah prefers the two rak'ah of a married person over the 70 rak'ah of a single man. That tells you the difference. Two versus seventy is a lot. A big difference. But the Prophet said Allah loved the two rakah of a married person more than the seventy rakah of a single one. Another hadith, of the, another hadith of the Prophet about the importance of marriage. The Prophet says, Man arada an yalqa Allah. Whoever want to meet Allah yawm al qiyamah with the smile on their face. He said, فَلْيُلْقِهِ وَهُوَ مُتَزَوِّجِ should meet Allah when he or she is married. If you want to meet Allah and there's a smile on your face, you are qiyamah. You are not sad. You are not unhappy. I said the way to do it is to make sure that you are married in this. That is the importance of marriage. Now, there are so many ahadiths in regarding the importance of marriage. Now, the second part of the topic is how to choose the spouse in Islam. And that is where the importance of marriage comes in. Because here, it's very important because if you and I make a mistake here, it's not only that I'm putting myself into trouble, also the generation to come also will be affected from my decision. And that is why it's very important. When we come to make a choice of choosing a spouse, I have to think far away. Not to think about today. No, because today I'm a single, I'm going to be a husband, but tomorrow I'm going to be a father, and then becomes a grandfather. So all these children, generation that are coming, they will all base on the decision that I make today. If that decision is made correctly, the children to come, they will benefit from that decision. If the decision was made wrong, also the children will be affected from that decision as well. That is why it's very important to make sure that when we make the choice, when we want to choose, we have to make the right choice. Number one, here the Prophet tells us that when you want to choose a spouse, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he started from men. 
It started from men. I said, if a man wants to choose a woman, the Prophet gave four qualities to look. One of these four, if any of these four is found in a woman, the Prophet said, you are allowed to marry her on the Sunnah of the Prophet. The first condition, the first quality the Prophet mentioned, is a tunkahul mar'atu ala arba'in. The first one, it says, limadiha. A person wants to marry a woman because she's wealthy. She has a lot of money. You don't want to work. You want to sit, relax, enjoy the money. Why not? See how Islam is so kind. You get a woman, she's rich. You sit on the couch. There is remote control. You flip all the channels of the wall. The tea is coming back and forth. Credit card is working. Alhamdulillah. No sorrow, no grief. The Prophet said, if that is what you want, and the woman is not, doesn't have any problem, I say, go for it. You are allowed to marry somebody because of a wall. That's one. That's option number one. Option number two, the Prophet says, وَتُنْكَعُ الْمَرْعَةُ لِجَمَالِهَا You can marry a woman because of how she looks, her beauty. A woman is, mashallah, she looks so super, super beautiful. <laughs> See, one of the good about Islam is this. Islam doesn't say that you have to marry somebody who is your not comfortable one. No. As a matter of fact, Islam wants you to marry a woman that when you walk in the house, you are happy that you're coming at home. You are happy when you look at her face. Like Imam Ali said about Zahra. He said, Kuntu idha nadartu ila Zahra injala anni al he said, anytime I just take a look at Zahra, all my sorrow and pain disappears. That is how a man should be. That when you look at your spouse, when you look at your wife, you are happy by looking at her face. Because of her beauty, because of her love. The prophecy is another reason a man can base on to marry a woman. That's number two. Number three. وَتُنْكَ الْمَرْأَةُ لِمَقَامِهَا a position a woman has. Her father is president of the country. Her father is a minister. Right? Her father is, I don't know, any position that he holds, or she herself holds the position. And you know that if you marry her, mashallah, you get another position too. Next to her. As long as you have the right to do that. That is option number three. Number four, the Prophet says, وَتُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِدِينِ you can marry a woman because of her deed, her faith, her iman, her fear of Allah. He said, you can marry a woman because of these four reasons. Then the Prophet comes back and tells each one of us. He said, you know all the four options that I gave? Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, if you ask me as an aspect. See, when you want to buy a car, you always look for an aspect in the car, right? So they can give you a good deal. So that you buy a good car. You want to buy a house, you're looking for a good person who is a good realtor. So that way he can find a good deal. The prophet said, I'm the expert in this field when it comes to choosing a spouse. So if you want my opinion, I tell you who is the best out of the four. He said, the best of the four is the one with the deal. The fourth one. Now let's say we are Americans, right? We always ask why. And our children, that's wrong, right? We Americans, anything that you say, say why. You tell our children, go to sleep, they say why. You want to drink your water, why? Now let's be Americans, we're going to ask Rasulullah, why? Why not the first one? Now here the Prophet answered. He says, that the reason why I tell you the fourth is the best of all, this my reason. Reason number one. He said, if you marry a woman because of money, he said, there is no guarantee the money will stay forever. If the money finish, then the marriage finish. Because the reason of marriage is gone. So the marriage is also, is gone. So it's not a good reason to marry a woman because of that. So if you marry somebody because of money, the money is gone, that's it, the marriage is over. That is number one. Number two, you marry somebody because of her beauty. They say it's not a good reason. Why? Today she is 20, 21, mashallah. She looks beautiful. 
Now tell me the same thing when she becomes 75. <laughs> it's the same person. It's the same woman, right? She was the beautiful woman at the age of 25. But the same woman now, 70, you don't see the same thing you used to see. So what happened to the marriage? Now the marriage is in trouble because I don't see what I used to see before. That's what the Prophet says. This is not a good reason. So what should I do? Ya Rasulullah. Now let's go to the third. The Prophet said, no, that is not a good reason either. Why? He said, because position is always given by people and they can take it to. How many of us vote somebody in the office? The next day I say, I didn't know that he's that bad. Next day I'm not voting him in. And then the next day he doesn't get the vote and he doesn't have the position anymore. Oh no, the people vote him or they vote her in the position. When he does something against their will, they say, you know what, you're not longer our president. You come down. That's it. We don't want you anymore. That position is gone. So any of these three, there is no guarantee to base on that to make your marriage work. That's why the prophet said, these three are not a good reason. Which one is the best, Ya Rasulullah? I say the religion. What is the base? He said, because the religion is based on Allah. And Allah is always and will always be there. Not like other three. And then he said, let me add another thing also. And that is, he said, if a person marry a woman because of a deen, he said, Allah automatically tells the other three, go with this one, which is the fourth one. Which means if a woman, a man marry a woman because of a deen, then Allah let the beauty come in. Then Allah sent the position to come in. Then Allah sent money to come in as well. The other three automatically will follow because this is the best of the all. That is the prophet saying. Now, there is a, this is if the person is a man. Now, what about if it's a woman? She was also looking to marry somebody who is, let's say for example, a mu'min, just looking for. What is the quality that Islam has put in front of a woman? To look in order to choose a right spouse. Also, the Prophet says, He said, When any person, a man, walks into my house and asks my daughter's hand, the Prophet says, Look at these two things. Number one, he says, Deen, look at his religion. Meaning, is he praying? Is he fasting? Is he fearful of Allah? Not what we always look for. Unfortunately today, when somebody walk into our house for marriage, you know what we ask? We ask impossibles. Impossibles meaning we ask in things that doesn't exist. Because some of us, some of the sisters, and you something from the brother's side, MashaAllah, they give you a list of a person they look like they want Allah to make another person different according to their shape. Like you go to the car company and you give the car company, oh car company, I want you to make this type of car. Design this car like this for me. <laughs> they put some conditions like they tell Allah, Ya Allah, you didn't create anybody with this quality, but this is the person that I'm looking for, so I want you to design a human being like this. For example, say that I want somebody to be only say you. You say it is good and it's not. There is no doubt about that. But it shouldn't be the only reason to base on to marry. Because remember our prophets and the Imam, they were Sayyids too. But they married outside the Sayyid. Which means it's okay to marry outside the Sayyid. Yes, if a person is a Sayyid or a Sayyid and she marries somebody a Sayyid, it's good. However, that shouldn't be the only reason that if a person is not a Sayyid, I'm not getting married to them. That is one problem. Number two, sometimes we even put height. He has to be six foot three. If he's six foot four, I don't want it. If he's six foot and two and a half, I don't want it. It has to be six three. Allah, what, what? Maybe, I don't know where Allah SWT has created somebody in that size and looking, that this has to be somebody who uh, matches your, your intention. There's no, nothing like that. Sometimes we ask another thing. We say, hey, the person has to be, for example, he has, so this is from the brothers, she has to know how to cook biryani. 
Your brother, have you ever seen something? Have you ever heard something called she can learn to cook it? There's something called she can learn after the marriage. Why is that? Thing? She has to be a person who knows how to cook his food. Alhamdulillah, there's a recipe on Almighty Google. She can Google <laughs> and find anything and then she can learn. What's the big deal? That is one of the problems we have. That we say she has to know how to. And on top of that, he has to have American passport. <laughs> Canadian passport or Australian passport. If he has, let's say, Ghanaian passport. No. <laughs> Any other passport that is not these three countries, not in the list. That is one of the choices. Some of the choices, they say he has to have this amount of money. How much? He has to have at least half a million in his account. Allah Akbar. That is one of the conditions. And so many, and so many, and so many, that if you go, we'll make it more complicated than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do. The Prophet and Imam, they told us to make the marriage very easy so that people can get married. That is not something that Islam has taught us. For that matter, the Prophet told us, when a man comes to my house to ask for your daughter's hand, he said, what you should look for? Tardawna deena, the religion. Is he practicing? Is he a mu'min? Is he, mu is he a person who fears Allah? That is what is more important. Number two, wa khuluqa. Look at his behavior. It's very important. Because they ask Imam Hussein alayhi salam, why did the Prophet put this condition for sisters that a man have to have a good character? Imam Hussein says because Because when he becomes angry at her, he wouldn't oppress her. If he has a khlaq, he always have a limit. He wouldn't go beyond that to oppress the wife. And if he loves her, when everything is normal, he always will treat her in the right way as well. That's why akhlaq is very important. Today, one of the reasons why, brothers, our marriage have a lot of problems and we have the rate of divorce so high is because we neglect all these things from the Prophet in al Bayt and we created our own. And that is the problem that we have. So the Prophet said, Anybody who walks in and he is a Muslim and good practicing Muslim, he said, Number two, look at his manners, his character. If he has these two, the Prophet said, Allow him to get married to your daughter. Why? He said, If you fail, The Prophet said, There will be a lot of corruption. And fitna, which is trial and troubles after that, if we fail to do that. Now, what are the trials and troubles? That is sometimes, inshallah, we'll discuss about that into details. But the point is, these are the qualities that the Prophet has put in front of us for both brothers and sisters. If these qualities are met, one have all the right to make the choice of a good sister or a good brother. Now, let's say I find somebody with all these qualities. Now, who gets to choose in the family? Is it the father or is it the mother? Here, there is a lot of clash between the families when it comes to this. But before I tell you who is the right person to make that decision and who is not, let me share with you some of the argument that our scholar mentioned that most of the both parties make when it comes to getting married. Because first, the children say, we have the right to choose, not the dad and mom. Dad and mom say, no, we have the right to choose, not you, a son or a daughter. And each one of them have their reasons. First, I'm going to present you the reasons and then come to the conclusion to that, what the Islam say for both of them. Number one, let's start with the children. The children, the reason is that, dad and mom, I have the right to make my choice. Why? Because your time is over. You are 40, 80 years old. And you think you can make the right decision today? No, Dad. No, Mom. I am this time. I'm born in this century. I understand what it needs in this century and what this life is about. 
And I think about it as the time of computer, it's time of typing, texting. Your time is not a time of texting. So how do you think you can make the right decision for me when you are not in the central drama? That is argument number one from the youth. Number two, they say, Dada, Mom, look at the marriages that we have in the world today. And most of them, where, where most of the marriage fail because the dad and moms are in debt. Because most of the marriages that are failed because the parents arranged it. So why do you want me to let you arrange for me when I know so many people they have the same arranged marriage and it didn't work? So do you want my marriage to get failed too? To be failed? That is reason number two from the youth. Reason number three. They say to the daddy and mom, daddy and mom, it doesn't matter who you want to choose for me. But let me tell you something. You don't understand so many things. He said, you see, the sister you see her at the masjid with the hijab, she looks pious. When we get together out somewhere, she's not the same sister you think. And the masjid, she's something, she is a different sister at the outside, she is a different sister. But you don't know because you only see her work at the masjid. And always when you see her in the hijab, you think, MashaAllah, she is like Zahra alayhi salam. But outside, Allahu Akbar, she is hid. There's two different personalities. So how do you want me to marry somebody who has these two personalities? But you don't understand that. I go out, I spend time, I see, I know, but you don't. So if I allow you to make that decision, you will make a wrong decision. That is the argument of the youth. Now let me show you some of the argument of the parent. Parent, they say no. We have the right to choose for you. So why? He says, from day one, we care for you. We raised you. We protected all your interests. Everything that is good for you, we did. We sent you to school. We sent you to Islamic school. We did. We made sure that you grew up in the best environment because we want good for you. And now you think we wouldn't want good for you when it comes to spouse? Of course we won't. Because we have always want good for you. And we will always do. For that matter, we have the right to make the choice for you who to marry. That's number one. Number two, the parents says, they said, look, you might be a doctor, you might be an engineer, you might be whatever you want to be. But when it comes to a field of a husband and wife, you are zero experience. <laughs> Your head is zero. There is nothing there. Why? Because you never experienced this line. He said, I, as your father, I, as your mother, I have experienced this world, and I know and I have more experience than you are. So why shouldn't I make that choice for you? Because I have more experience. That is the parents. Number three, the parents, they said, we have the right to choose because we are the parents. Allah gave us the right to make that decision for you and to make decision for who you should be in your life. And so many reasons. Now, which right between the two? You have heard the two reasons, right? Everybody has the reasons. And some of the reasons between from the both sides make sense. Now, which one is the right one? Which one Islam gave the right to make the decision? Is it the parent or is it the child? Now I'll tell you the answer is it's not the child and it's not the parent. Okay, Who is it? Both of them. Islam didn't say to the child, you should make that decision on your own because yes, you are the one who is going to live in that life. You are the one who is going to spend the rest of your life with that person. But at the same time, Islam said, the parents, you are not also the fault, the only one to make that decision. It should be teamwork. Both the parents and both the child. And the reason is, the Islamic reason is this. Islam says, the reason why it should be both, because the parents, their job in this matter is that to help the child to make the right choice. Because if the child makes the wrong choice, it's not only it's going to affect him, it's going to affect the parents too. Because the parents cannot sit down and watch their children. It's going to do hardship because of the decision that he made. So they will be involved too. So to protect that, Islam said, 
the parents also have to be given the right to make that decision as well. But at the same time, then Islam says, look, mom and dad, even though I gave you the right to help the child to make that decision, but at the same time, remember that this child is the one who is going to live in that life, not you, a mom or dad. For that matter, he or she has to have the saying in that as well. Let me share with you a story about the Prophet. At the time of the Prophet, there was a sister who her parents forced her to get married. And then the child, the daughter said, no, I don't want the man. They forced her. They said, either you marry her or you are not our child anymore. The daughter said, no, I'm not marrying the person. The Prophet was there. The sister went to the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah, this is the situation. My mom and dad, they chose somebody they want me to marry, but I don't want to marry that person. What should I do, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet said, ma sana He said, accept what your parents did. Accept the marriage. He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want to. The Prophet said, accept the marriage. He said, no, I don't want you. Three times. Then the Prophet said to her, if you don't want to accept the marriage, it's your right in Islam. That you have the choice not to accept if you don't want to. When the, when, when the Prophet mentioned this to her, she said, Ya Rasulullah, now that you say this, now I accept it. What do you mean? I was trying to convince you a minute ago, and you are not <laughs> listening. Suddenly I say this, you say you accepted the marriage? What is the case? She said, Ya Rasulullah, all I was trying to do is to let the people out there to know that Allah has given a Muslim sisters the choice to make of who they want to live with. But when you made it clear that it's my choice in Islam, now I'm surrendering to my parents' opinion that I will marry that person. And the Prophet sallallahu made the offer her because she listened to her parents. Here for that matter, in Islam, the one who has the right to make the choice who should marry or who not to marry, it's not just one party, not the other. Islam has given that right upon the both the parents and the child together. That they both have to make that decision and make sure that they make the right decision together. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala You know, with this marriage, we need to compromise so much. Wow. If we will compromise with this religion, do you mean with this deen? Anybody who's practicing Muslim, even Shia or Sunni, they can get together in Islam. I mean, fourth condition. Um, the answer is what we said about compromise or somebody with deen meaning somebody with the Islamic principles. And when we talk about marrying between the two school of thought, like a Sunni marrying a Shia or a Shia marrying a Sunni, our scholars they didn't forbid that. When you go to our fiqh, it's not haram. But they discourage it because of their some kind of different opinions in the school of thought. They discourage it because of that school of thought differences. However, if a person, between the two of them, they came to agreement to understand that this sister is a Shia, or this brother is a Shia, and this is what they, they, they believe, because for example, there are some incidents that we have that a Sunni, a Shia sister, married a Shia Muslim, a Sunni brother, when Muharram comes, he doesn't give it permission to go to Majalis. Because I don't believe in Imam Muslim. I don't believe in Ashura, for that matter. And it becomes a problem. Or for example, sometimes 
a husband and, and wife, they have the child. A wife wants the children to do such that on the turba, and the husband says, no, I don't believe in that. Or for example, I want to go to Ziyarah. He said, to my belief, it's a shirk, for example. So there is a lot of problems in between. Our scholars, they discourage that. However, if there was understanding between the two families, that everybody knows their line and where to join the line, and they can be peaceful, which also have happened. There are some families that are two different school of thought. They are married and they agree how the children should be raised and what not to do, what to do, and who should be in charge. If these lines are clear, then there is no any harm in that. So when we say about being a religious, practicing Muslim, it can be from both sides if that person has been to be. So we've talked about selecting a uh, spouse. Well, after you get married, uh, how do you mean we mentioned the word compromise, which is basically every married person knows that, <laughs> what marriage means. So how to deal with any differences or anything that is unexpected that you find? I mean, what is the level of tolerance and which things you should tolerate and which things you have to sort of stick to what you would expect. That question demands another complete session. Session, yeah. Yeah, that should be between like talking about what are the causes of problems in marriages. Yeah. Right. Some marriage issues right. and how to deal with those issues. Yeah. This are also, I think, is a good session that we can talk about okay. that through the hadith and what are the solutions to it. But to answer, to answer your question quickly, the answer to every problem in the family is one word, communication. Talk, okay? And I, mean, I don't mean talk after 30 years, no, no, now. <laughs> when I say communicated, I'm not saying, okay, keep piling the problems, okay. He did this today, I'm gonna write it in my book, in diary. Yes, on these days, on that day, he did this. And then the second time I write, and I keep, when my book filled up, I said, okay, now is the time to blow up. Now I want divorce, because I can't take it anymore. That's not what I mean with communication. My meaning communication is, the day it happened, it have to be talked about that day. However, you have to be smart too. <laughs> to pick up at the right time to talk. Yeah, to pick the battle at the right time. That's right. Because if you pick at the wrong time, you make the situation worse. <laughs> like for example, the worst man come from home, from work, he had enough at the job, yeah. right? He is tired, his head is full. At the door, you tell him, huh, last night you didn't do the dishes. You support, Allah Akbar. <laughs> now you see what's gonna happen that day. <laughs> yes, he tried to communicate. But the timing was a bad time. <laughs> so you have to pick the right time and to make sure that that communication is done properly. So there are these issues, but the point is, in every issue that comes between husband and wife, they have to talk. Talking is the key. And you see in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even said, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعِذُوهُنَّ That when there is any dispute between husband and wife, as soon as you see it coming, the prophet said, the solution is to talk. <laughs> Dialogue, sit down, talk, and discuss about it, and get the solution as soon as possible, and move from there. Yes. Yes, since we are talking about timing, what is, the good, what is a good time to, to marry? For example, there are some parents who try to convince their kids that, you know, you should, should get married. For example, Kasim is sitting over here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are some kids who think that their parents are, you know, they, they, they don't care about me because I think I should get married and they are not paying any attention. So what is the good time? Um, there is no specific age time of marriage. But Islam encourages that as sooner as possible. That's what Islam says. But there is no specific age. But what they say is that the moment the child is ready to take the responsibility, that is the time of getting married. Because marriage is a responsibility. It's not like, oh, we're gonna get married, inshallah, and that's it. No, no, no. He is becoming a leader. Is he ready for that leadership? He's gonna be the leader of the family. 
Today day two, tomorrow they're gonna count three and four, and then they keep going. Now, if he's not ready to take that responsibility, it doesn't matter if he's 100 years old, then he shouldn't get married. If he is ready, spiritually, mentally, physically, <clears throat> financially, to take that responsibility, as soon as he becomes valid, that's the time to get married. So the point is, the time, the person is ready at <coughs> all these levels, that is the right time to get married. Yes. 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 Now, I have a question about um, cousins, marrying the first cousins. So let's suppose uh, husband and wife are first cousins, and uh, their kids grow up, and then they say, okay, the guy is very good, I like, everything is fine, but he's my first cousin, because you are also first cousins, I don't want to marry my first cousin because of scientific reasons. So what is your take on that? Um, Islamically, there is no problem marrying cousins. As a matter of fact, we have some ahadiths encourage that. When you go to Imam Ali السلام, and Fatima السلام, their marriage wouldn't found it. And Islam also encouraged even Prophet and Khadija, when you go to the line three, they get at to end at the grandfather. And by the way, let me make this easier. We're all cousins, by the way. Because <laughs> our father is Adam and our mother is Hawa, right? So at the one point, we end at what? Somewhere else. So we are all one family at some point. So the point is, if that family, who happen to be cousins, happen to be a good family, good people, there is no harm for a child to marry for his first cousins. That is absolutely fine, Islamically. But also, it depends to the husband or the child, if they are not willing, because some people said, you know, marrying cousins, the children comes with some defect and some problems, which they try to prove. If there is any reason to believe that, and the person wants to avoid, that is their choice. But Islamically, it's okay if the person chooses to do that. So, uh, in, in the Ummah conference, uh, Sheikh Kazwini said that uh, he was encouraging prenuptials. Mm -hmm. He was saying that it's better to write down all your conditions and get an agreement before the marriage so that you don't get into trouble afterwards if there is a is that something encouraged in islam or is this some, some social thing that he was uh, uh, proposing yes in islam prior to marriage i think i mentioned that prior to marriage islam encouraged something we call counsel and counseling is counseling counseling yeah, meaning both the husband and wife need to be counseled to know what their rights are. Because one of the marriage problems that we have in the world today is lack of knowledge about each other's rights. For example, the husband doesn't know what is his right. He saw his mother used to cook for the father, so he comes and says, okay, you have to cook because that is my right. Or for example, the mother used to do certain things, so he expects the same thing from his wife. Maybe those things are not from your, from your right. Maybe your mother used to do that out of her kindness to your father, so you cannot expect the same thing from your spouse. So the point is, we have to know what are our Because in Islam, there is what we call zawj, the right of a spouse, which is the husband, and then there is a corpus zawja, which is the right of a woman as well. That in the marriage, Islam was designed, and by the way, you know that in Islam, a women have been given more right than a man. Some scholars counted the right that Islam was given just to a woman, it's almost over 100 Just for the sisters. <coughs> And sometimes we think that no, it's our right. For example, like let's say when, when you come to cooking, Islamically, it's not the duty of a, a sister to do that. If she wants to cook, that's not, if she doesn't want, it's not her. It's, it's not a responsibility to do that. For example, even in Islam, a sister can charge her husband for breastfeeding her own child. 
I'm not saying that sisters should charge, but I'm just doing it just as long knowledge. Right? That her sister, she can say, I want 50 bucks for every breastfeeding. And you have to put it on the table and it's watching. Does his mom say that? Maybe condition yeah. of the one of the conditions. Yes, that can be. So for that matter, writing any agreement before the marriage is something that is a good idea so everybody is clear what to expect and what not to expect. To know what is the right of spouse or what is the right of the husband and what is the right of a wife. So it's a good thing to do. Islamically, there is nothing wrong with what doing so before the marriage. Yes. Uh, you know, after listening to what you just said, is it, uh, I'm reminded of something, is it true that the, the uh, rules of marriage are classified in the, in the Book of Commerce in, in Acta? Yes. Absolutely. We have like in the fifth, you know, every 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 um merja he has two kinds of risala amaliya. One is called al ibadat. Al ibadat means worshipers, worshipers. And for example, salat, fasting, hajj, zakat, they have one risala just for that. The second part they call it al muamalat, dealings. And the zawal, the marriage is one of the dealings. Negotiations. Yes. Because marriage is a contract. That's called abad. You're putting yourself and the other party into contract. So there are in Islam the rules of how to do and what not to do. What are the right that, what are the things that you allow? What are the things that you're not allowed? What are the things if you do, it makes your, your marriage void. So yes, it is in effect. Yes. Yes. In in uh, Islam in Mecca, you have I mean Usually there's a dowry that the husband has to pay to the wife. What's the uh, rationale behind that? Is it is it sort of and is it for the wife or it's for the parents of the wife? Yes, al mahar or dowry in Islam is the right that Allah has given to the sister. Okay, it's for the wife. It's for, for the wife to be. For her protection. For her protection. But not necessary as we understand today. No. Because some people they think dowry is something to ask the husband to pay so he doesn't divorce her. No, that's not what dowry is about. Because that is why today you see a lot of men, what they do is that if they want to divorce the sister and they already been you know, uh, contracted to pay millions of dollars or something they cannot afford, so what they do? They find something to do to upset the sister to the point where she say, you know what? I'm enough, it's enough, I don't want the dowry, just divorce me. And that's what they do. So it's not under protection anymore. Because now what they do is they use that because they know they don't want to pay or they can't pay. So they put the pressure on the sister in another way. So she is forced to even give a whole up so he can divorce her, so he doesn't have to pay that. So it's not a protection. But what it is is that Islam has put this a symbol. It's, a, it's supposed to be a symbol of respect and honor to a woman that you are taking her hand. That is what the dowry is about. So, but dowry is not something to ask that, okay, yeah, it's like I'm selling my daughter. So you have to pay this amount of money so I can pay how much I pay for their college tuition. No, that's not what the dowry is about. Dowry supposed even in a in a hadith we have different hadith that if any dowry goes beyond the dowry of Zahra is makruh because nobody is better than Zahra and how much is dowry Zahra's dowry according to the hadith they say it was arba'in dirham forty dirham that was what Imam Ali paid some analysis it was four hundred but in any case it was something simple that Islam has put that a man has to pay to a woman. And that dowry, it doesn't go to the parents. No, it goes to the sister. And it's her right. If she wants to take it, she wants to give it, she wants to do anything that she wants, it's her right that she can use it in any way that she wants. And you have yes. two, two questions. One about this uh, uh, dowry of Janabir Fatwa to Zahra. Yes. Uh, and Alan told me that 40 dirham in those days, the coins were, were made of gold. So if you, if you, you know, Compare the 40 dirham of that time to you know whatever it, it would be today. It's more than 22 uh, grams of uh, uh, no, not, it's it's a, it's a kilo or two kilo of gold or something like that. 
So will, will that be okay? That's question number one. Okay. Yes. Question number two is, it seems that the Seva Tunneka is initiated by the, by the girl, not by the boy. Why is it that the, in, in our culture, you know, it's the boy who proposes the girl, not the other way? <laughs> yes. See, uh, number one about the doubt of Zahra alayhi salam, I, haven't, I have seen some people make that comment, but I don't have, uh, you know, the right information to back this up or to deny that. That it was about gold and it was this amount of gold. I don't know. It might or might not be. But if that is the case, then it's fine. One can ask the case. The one can ask that the daughter should be something similar, which is also equivalent to today's. That is fine. There is, no, there is nothing wrong with that. That is in that regard. But the number two, the question number two, which is in regard of why in Islam a woman is the one initiating the marriage. Like when it happened, he said, Zawaj to care, nafsi. In Islam, it can be both sides. In fact, a man can start it too, can initiate it too, can say, Zawaj to care, nafsi. It's can. However, mostly it's done by the sister. But it is, both parties can start either one. However, in Islam, we are also allowed as a sister to initiate for somebody to get married. Unfortunately, it's a culture-wise that today we think it looks at a cheap woman. If she goes and she asks somebody, oh, what, can you allow to get married with me? It's like putting the family down. But that's not the case. That absolutely that's not the case. I'll give an example. Khadija alayhi salam, wasn't she was the one who proposed to the Prophet? And that, even after she proposed to the Prophet, she became Sayyida to Nisa in the Alameen of the time. That's Khadija alayhi salam. They didn't lower anything in her position, as a matter of fact, they raised her higher than what she used to be. That is number one. Number two, also in the Quran, Shu'ayb alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam. Musa, when he flew and left uh, Egypt and went to Median, and he saw the children of Shu'ayb when they came to fetch water, and he helped them to fetch water. When they went home, which was unusual to them, and the father asked them, why did you come home on early today? They said, because we saw a man who was kind enough to get his water. One of the daughters, she said to her father, Ya abatis ta'jir. Dad, I want him to reward him. She said, what are, you, what are you talking about? She was talking about, he's a nice guy. I think he'll be good for the money. And the father sent her to go and permission all that. She came in the modesty, she was shy, and she called Musa to her father. And then the father proposed, and this is one thing too. See, the girl initiated, and the father helped also, and the father Shuaib told Musa I want you to marry one of my daughters. So also, it's not a, it's not a putting yourself low as a father. If you see the right person, the right child, to say, I think you are a good child for my God. And you can initiate it, that, that's fine too. So in Islam, it can be from any side. Sometimes from the brother's side, and sometimes it can be from the sister's side. And that will not make you or your family cheap. As a matter of fact, it helps and make your family to be higher in the sight of Allah. Because we have in the hadith in the prophet, uh, from the prophet in Ahlul Bayt that any person, any person <coughs> who helps two individuals to unite them into marriage, their thawab, nobody knows other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a great job to bring two people together to get married. However, however, if it didn't work, then may Allah bless your soul. If it worked, you are the angel. If it didn't work, Allah Akbar, you are the shaitan because you are the them together. But you have to be patient because your niya is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. I have two questions. One, in terms of when to get married, you mentioned that financial, being financially ready. So what, kind, what constitutes being financially ready? Financially independent or financially mature or what is it? And then second is... Um, what other specific characteristics other than fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are we to look for in choosing a spouse in terms of the uh, number one in terms of the financial see we don't Islam doesn't say that you have to have thousands and thousands of dollars in your account before you can marry. No. 
The risk is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah stated, وَرِزْكُكُمْ فِي السَّمَاءُ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ Allah said, your sustenance is coming from Him. And trust me, we just have to understand and believe that the risk is not your job and my job which, which gives your risk. The job is nothing but means. <coughs> they are just wasilah to them. The sole provider is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And trust me, if you have a job, something that you can make a lot of and take care of your family, that's the time to get married. It doesn't have to be like, I have to have maybe, for example, 15 bedrooms, house, then I can get married. Because one room for computer, one room for the guests, <laughs> one room for my shoes, one room for my clothes, one room for, Allah, for my dog, my cat. No, you don't need all of that. If you have one room, that is enough for you and your wife, that's it. And trust me, if Allah provides you with a child, Allah will open another risk where you can earn another money to buy another house for them, which will be enough for them. Because remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the risk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He created a mouth where you want to put the food and water and everything, before Allah created the mouth, Allah already created the food waiting, then He created the mouth. Now listen to the Quran. Before Allah created human being, Allah said, Inni ja'ilun fil ard. The earth was already there, but Allah didn't create a human being. The food, the plant, everything was already there. Then Allah said, Now I want to create a human being to come and benefit from this system. So risk is already there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is provider. If we have the true faith in Allah, all we need is to have some sort of income where I can take care of myself and take care of my family and that is what we need. So we don't need to have so many, I have to be making, let's say, thousands and thousands of dollars, then now I can get married. No, and by the way, money does not buy a good and sustains marriage. No, what buys and sustains marriage is something else. Yes. But what if they're a student and they don't have any income whatsoever? Then you have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to wait because Allah stated in Surah An-Nur, وَالْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْلِيهُمُ اللَّهِ Allah said, for those who cannot afford, Allah said, they should wait. Until Allah prepared the ground for them, then they can go out and get married. If parents are uh, trying to help them, <laughs> I, mean, I, I have um, I have three kids, yes. and the first one is twenty. When he was twenty years old, and uh, he got he got married at the age of eighteen, and he got married and uh, at the at the age of uh, twenty. And uh, after the marriage, he got the job. Yes, and we were trying to support him. Yes. In his case also, we are trying to convince him. We will support him. So, yeah, we'll so afterwards. <laughs> and and he's the last one. We don't have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a bottle in your bush. Very simple subsistence. Yes. For the married family. Yes. Very See, simple. Yes. Nothing simple. Yeah. See, in Islam, in Islam, it's like Hajj. That's the rule. That's the fake rule. If you don't have money to go to Hajj, Islam says not Hajj. You can stay for the rest of your life. You don't go to Hajj, that's fine. But the moment somebody said, I will provide you every minute to go to Hajj, then the rule changes to Hajj. Now you don't have any choice anymore. Because the means is provided. Now, if a person wants to get married, he says, I don't have money because I'm still a student, then the moment that says, no, we will provide. We will provide the basic needs of you and your wife, then there is no excuse. No one has to jump and depend on our Let me continue on this question. Yes. My children are slightly older than him, yes. and they are still trying to establish themselves financially, mm -hmm. and they're very concerned, and they think mm -hmm. that they are not in the right financial, independent, and they're very worried. Uh, not worried, I was concerned. Uh, this is one. And the other thing is that it's always difficult to start this topic of marriage. In the current age, in the current culture of college graduates in America, mm -hmm. they don't like this discussion. Whenever we start, they try to disappear. So how do you, uh, 
how do you start this thing? I mean, similar to a combination of his question, and how do you get those adult kids interested in that topic? Uh, number one, I think we have to start these topics from different angles. And the angle is first, we can never ever stop being concerned about financial. Human being, even if Allah give you the entire universe, you will still be concerned. That's us. You have? Practice this. A person have one bedroom. Say all I need. It's a lesser from the homeless. He doesn't have a house. He's sleeping outside. You say, okay, I'm gonna get you one bedroom where you can sit and sleep and you don't have to worry about where to sleep. Think you take the house, the house, one bedroom. After a while, he's gonna tell you, "I wish I have two bedrooms." Well, so I have one bedroom for the guests, one for myself. He said, "Okay, we give you two bedrooms." After the two bedrooms, after a while, he's gonna tell, "I wish I have three bedrooms." Why do you need three bedrooms? So I need one bedroom for myself, one computer room, one for the guests. Okay. Now you give him three. You give him four. The more he gets, the more his needs rises. That is human being. So we can never stop. Not we can never stop being concerned at any point. Even if you have, let's say you are, you think the the richest people in the world, they still don't have concern. They have the concern how to sustain that money. They have concern how to grow it. So the concern will always be there. The point is, we just have to be content about what we have and appreciate Allah and ask Him to open the door for us. That's it. So that is the point we have to understand, that we as a Muslim, if you want to say that I have to have this, I have to have this, sometimes Allah gives up after you get married. Sometimes it's not just I have to get it before I marry. No. Some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wait for you to have that tawakkul on Him, then Allah opens the door for you. So we just have to let them understand that concern would always be there. However, what is the best is, to always plan for yourself and depend on Allah. Yes. How do you get them? For example, I received Brother Ahmed's email yes. a few hours ago, and he, he said, the email mentioned that it is about marriage and so on. I talked to both of my kids at home, and they said, as soon as they heard that it's about marriage, they said, no way. <laughs> they were they feel embarrassed, they feel uncomfortable. See, I don't know, because they feel. How do you get them into this kind of lecture, for example? No, number one, we don't have to get them into this lecture. First of all, we can start one in one direction. First of all, we have to know why are they running away from this type of topic. You have to ask them. Because first, we cannot prescribe a medicine unless we know what the disease is. First, when you go to the doctor, first you want to understand what is your problem. Because they can't say, okay, because I'm the doctor, I'm going to write Tylenol. Or I'm going to write, let's say, for example, any other medicine. No, they have to know what the problem First, we have to understand what is it that caused them to be running away from these issues, from these topics. What is it that they're afraid of? And then from knowing what the problem is, we can address the right decision. We can help them to think right and help them from that angle. First, we have to get them to, and we have to let them speak. And then, see, sometimes that is one of the things that I'm saying. Even in our gatherings, we as a parent, we have to have the ear of listening. It's not always the other way around. Because most of parents, you have to listen. Always. You have to be the lecturer. No. Sometimes it's better as a father or the mother to listen to your problem, the problems of the children. <coughs> because the children go through certain things we don't know of. And sometimes they don't want to talk to us because the way the relationship is. So sometimes we have to give them the chance, just talk, what is it? The more you get to know what the problem is, the more you can address the problem. Yes. I think, I mean, the yes. last question. What does Islam no, recommend question. about uh, Muta? Allah. <laughs> That's a topic by itself. That's a long session. I prefer to do this one on one session, not the group yeah. session. No, but it's one of the things that is in Islam and is mentioned in the Quran. However, there are conditions of it. It's not just open check. No. That I can just go and do whatever I do. No. 
There are conditions. Yes. See, in Islam, everything have conditions. Even dua, how to pray to Allah. Allah says there's conditions. Everything has a condition. Marriage is also one of the ibadah that comes with the condition. So yes, we have it in Islam, according to the Shia or al Bay school of thought, is there, but it has conditions and regulations that if a person meets them, yes. Yes. Yeah, one last. My question, um, Sheikh Jaleel, is yes. our community does not encourage women and men to mix together in general. Yes. And I think the kids feel this as the biggest hindrance in them talking about what they really see more in school is less over here in the community. And they feel more suffocated within the community and less outside. It is something we have all encouraged over a period of time, and myself including. How do you address this and give us guidance on how this should be addressed such that we don't feel guilty if we send our kids outside for a get-together or a party, whereas when it's our community, we don't let them mix, and we are always segregating men and women, adults and children. Um, in Islam, brother, brothers and sisters, Islam allows a gathering where there is men and women. In Ibadah, where there is a Salat, when you have go to Hajj, you see men and women, they do Tawaf together. You go to Safa and Marwa, the same thing. You go to every other uh, ibadah that we do, we do together in Islam. And Allah SWT has mentioned in the Quran, al mu'minun wal mu'minat ba'dhum awliya ba'd. That the female believers and the male believers, they are brothers of one another. So in Islam, we're brothers. However, what Islam discourages is, or Islam does not allow, as any mingle that will lead to haram. That is not acceptable in Islam. <coughs> Where a brother and a sister will gather in any gathering that will lead to haram, Islam says no, it's haram. We are not allowed to do that. However, in a healthy environment where there are people and the children, they sit down, they interact with each other knowing their limit. Knowing their limit. For example, no touching between the two genders. For example, no any bad talk that is not allowed in Islam. But they talk about certain issues, about their school, about life, they discuss that is absolutely allowed in Islam. It's not haram that a man and a woman or a brother and a sister, they sit to talk about life, about general things, that is absolutely fine. And I think there is no problem. Every community to try to organize certain things like that, where brothers and sisters, they come together under the supervision of people, adults. So that way, haram will not be done in that gathering. If that is the case, that is fine, there is no problem. So that way they can develop to know each other and then marry within the, each other. Because the problem, that's what sister is talking about today, you see, a lot of our brothers, they get to leave our Muslim sisters looking at the non-Muslims. We have our brothers in this community. That instead of marrying good sisters of Muslims, raised by Muslims, Shia Muslims, they leave all of these and go and marry non-Muslims. That is a problem. Then who will marry our sisters? That becomes a problem. So we have to make sure that we build this kind of bridge, so that way they get together in a healthy environment, in Islamic environment, and also they get married according to the teaching of Islam as well. So how do you do that? So, I think this will be more. Huh? Yeah. What I say that the idea is the Islamic environment actually that's something which is not very clear. I think we have we are running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time now. I think this seems like do you need one more session which yeah. takes sure. it from here to the how and no then how do we sustain the marriage? Inshallah, we can keep next week for that topic that I explain how can you create the Islamic healthy environment for brothers and sisters where they can interact and also protect the Islamic world line between the two of them, inshallah. Can we have just one last question, please? Yes, sister. The sister's question was, if say for instance the parents are a mixture of Shia and Sunni and they both agree with each other as far as neither one of them wanting to convert or going across, they continue to practice their religion the way it is. Right. How does that, or the way it affects the children, how, what is the guidance in that 
like generally it's the mother that does the raising of the children at home and she's uh, at first they always very liberal and they said no you will practice your religion I will practice my religion but when they have children they always fight for the names they always fight for their ways and women they are I mean women responsible for raising the children if women is, has some different religion I mean practicing religion um, and they raise di children differently at that time sometimes if Parents, they have difference of opinion. Kids always take advantage. We need to see when they get married. So far, I mean that that part that uh, what I mean what will be the effect of this uh, marriage on their children at that. No, definitely when two people, two individuals from two different schools of thought, they get married, whatever they agree between themselves, that is fine. But what they have to do, they have to make it clear how the children should be raised. That is have to make it clear that whether the children will be raised according to the teaching of Adam Bay, or they will be raised according to the teachings of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They have to make it clear. But if they say we're going to live it this way, like for example, some people said, no, the children will be raised like sushi. They say like Sunni house, Sunni <laughs> chef. No, am I working in Japan? But am I not working in the United States? So you can't say that because we were hoping that it's going to, it doesn't work that way. They have to specify how their children will be raised. Either one of them. Yes. Inshallah, we'll continue. Allah, 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 Allah,